brothers and my sisters. Welcome to Empowerment Tuesday, where, we'll, where we will be diving into our theological education on today, June the 13th, 2023. The title of this class is called The Introduction to Homiletics. And in this class, we will be discussing the art of sermon preparation. Now, I want us to understand if we're going to be effective and if we are going to make an impact as expositors of the word of God or preachers of the word of God, we must be diligent as we prepare and we must be thoughtful as we structure our sermons. And what I mean by us being diligent is that we have to be intentional about what we are doing as we prepare for the preaching moment on Sundays, on Sunday morning, it is not the time for us to wing it. It is not the time for us to just go for what we know, but we need to be prepared according to the will of God so the Holy Spirit can move within the preaching moment. So as we prepare our sermons and as we structure our sermons, we must always remember to have our thinking caps on while we are striving to hear from God and for God to move. In our preparation, while we are striving to hear from God, we must be focused not only on God, but we must be focused on those who we are going to minister to. And as we prepare for this moment, we must be repentant, prayerful, and we must understand who God is while we're trying to get the word that God wants us to give our audience. And there must be an understanding of who our audience is and who we will be engaging. And we must understand that our preaching and our teaching must hit everyone in the pews, from the youngest to the oldest, from the least educated to the most educated. We must be preparing ourselves for this moment. And as we approach the throne of grace, we are to approach God and his word reverently. We are to approach his word reverent, reverently as vessels that are willing, able, and ready, and fit to be used by God for his glory. Let us understand that the preaching moment is not for us to try to get pats on the back. It is not for us to try to move the crowd. It is for God to get the glory. So if we're going to be effective in creating good sermon outlines, we must become more efficient and be efficient when it comes to reading, recording, and reflecting on the Holy Scriptures. I'm going to say that one more time. We must be efficient when it comes to reading, to recording, and reflecting on the Holy Scriptures. In the initial phase of sermon preparation is one, we must observe the text. And this is where we will spend most of our study time. In this initial phase, we ask the questions, what do I see? What do I see in the text? I encourage all my students to have a good study Bible and to read the text and at le in at least five different translations of the Bible to give a more well-rounded look at the biblical text. This can be done at www.biblegateway.com. And as we observe the text, we then are at a place where we have an understanding. And now we are able to interpret the text. Remember, interpretation cannot come before observation. In the interpretation portion, we now have to answer the question, what does it mean? Once we have the interpretation of the text, which means 
we have the understanding of the original author's intent. Let, let, let me stop there. Because it, it is our goal as we study to understand what the original author's intent and meaning was. Our job is not to bring what we think and what we feel to the text. We are to go to the text and get out what God has for us and bring it out. So we're asking the question in interpretation, what does it mean? But then when we move to application, we have to ask the question, how does it work? Remember, I want you to understand this. A sermon can only be a sermon if it comes from God's word and is saturated in the Holy Spirit. If it's not rooted and grounded in the word of God and not saturated in the spirit, it is just a speech. To gain more from your time in the Bible, there are three habits that you must cultivate that will increase your productivity. You must learn to read the Bible, record what you find in the Bible, and reflect on what you have uncovered. We do this to gain a better understanding. We have to learn to read better, and we have to learn to read faster. We have to learn to read the Bible as if we are reading the Bible for the very first time. We have to learn to read the Bible as a love letter. And yes, the Bible is a love letter from God to you. And when you read, don't bite off more than you can chew. Remember, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And you're not going to get an award for how much you read the Bible. It is not competition. However, we are reading for understanding. I'm going to say that one more time. We are reading for understanding. It is easier, my brothers and my sisters, to digest a smaller amount. So pace yourself. Here are some strategies for reading so you maximize your understanding. This is a good place to take notes. Read thoughtfully. Read repeatedly. Read patiently. Read selectively. Read prayerfully. Read imaginatively. Read meditatively. Read purposefully. Read acquisitively. And read telescopically. Also, after we read, my brothers and my sisters, we want to record so we have better understanding. So I advise you to have a good journal as you begin to prepare. So I want you to write good, understandable notes. And so when you record what you see in the text, it is easier for you to go back and understand what you have read. Keep a record of your insights and your questions. Remember, you cannot build on something you don't have. Start where you are, even with elementary things. Everyone starts at the same place. But make sure you take good notes that you can understand. In your own words, summarize what you see in the text. So later, these thoughts will come back to you and you will have a reference. Doing this will help you to remember what you have discovered. Lastly, in this phase, we reflect. We take some time and think about what we have seen in the text. And we ask ourselves certain questions. What is going on in this passage? What is this passage telling me about God? And what is this passage telling me about myself? What do I need to do on the basis of what I am reading here? Understand, my brothers and my sisters, reflection or meditation is vital. That means it is very important to understanding God's word. Now, let us define homiletics. 
Homiletics, my brothers and my sisters, is a noun. And it means the art of preaching. In, in order for us to be effective preachers, there must be a study of the text. 2 Timothy 2.15. The scripture basically says, study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So as we look at that text, we understand that we must study to do our best to present ourselves to God and be able to accurately handle and skillfully teach the word of truth. And we can only do that if we read, record, and reflect. So as we move forward, a sermon must be historically accurate. Never come to a passage with, without knowledge of the history of the passage. Do your best to be contextually accurate. No verse should be interpreted in isolation from its context. We must be grammatically accurate. Every effort should be made to discover precisely what the original author meant. Understand, and we're going back to, to, to grammar school. Grammar matters when it comes to understanding what is written. It requires the study of the forms and structures of the words, and this is known as morphology. Morphology is a study and description of word formation in language. Furthermore, it means the study of the arrangement of phrases and sentences, or what is called syntax. And if you don't understand these words, Please be diligent and go and look them up so you have a greater understanding. As we go through the text, know your subject, know your objects, know your predicates, know your verbs and the tenses of the verbs. Know your prepositions. Many a doctrine swings on a simple preposition. A preposition may be the same as you find in another place, yet it may carry a different connotation altogether because of the context. When we read in context, we want to read what comes before and what comes after. We should give attention to the study of word meanings or the science of semantics. We must be doctrinally accurate. Ask yourselves these questions. What is the theological message of this passage? And for those who don't know what theology is, theology is the study of God. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the theological message of this passage? What is this passage telling me about God? I hope you understand that. What are the principles that transcend centuries, cultures, countries, and other barriers that may be derived from the passage? Now we want to look at physically preparing our sermon outline. Let's look at this example. Preparing your sermon outline. First, we want to start off with a title. And we want to make the title catchy. So I want you to think about it. But I want you to understand that your title or your sermon should never have vulgar references or sexual innuendos. Remember, we are building our hopes on things eternal. So we want to be godly in everything we do. And we want to be godly as we present, present ourselves in excellence as expositors of the gospel. So 
try to make your title catchy because this is what grasps people's attention. And remember, you have to grasp their attention in the first few minutes or you lose it. Next, as I prepare physically, I put my name. Then the scripture or key verse of our text. To craft an expository sermon, we must first solidify the theme of the text or unit of scripture under consideration. My brothers and my sisters, when this is determined, only then can we really decide the subject of the sermon. Even structure and sequence cannot be developed until the subject becomes clear. And yes, there is a structure and there is a sequence to your sermon because you want your sermon to flow and you want your sermon to make sense. Now let's talk about the opening of your sermon. In the opening of your sermon, you want to begin by stating your central idea as it lines up with God's word. You want to present this in an interesting and thought-provoking way that draws the hearer into your message. Do your best to make sure that what you are articulating makes sense and is clear so that it can be received on a personal and spiritual level by all those who are hearing God speak through you. Also in this process and throughout the whole sermon in your sermons as you preach them, do your best not to be redundant. That means saying the same things over and over again. Give the audience something that they can relate to in an, in an interesting and applicable way. This way, you can have and hold their attention. You can use interesting topics or current events. I simply say be creative. Do your best to be creative. Just make sure it's appropriate, it's interesting, and it draws your hearer into the sermon. As men and women of God, I said this before, we should never use inappropriate themes, cursing, or any form of vulgarity from the pulpit. You want to begin to develop where God is leading you to take yourself and your listeners in this message. Remember, it's about God. It's not about you. Now let's talk about the exposition. This is the substance of all preaching. Ask yourself these questions. What is the dominating theme? What are the integrating thoughts? When we look at the dominating theme, almost every passage of scripture has more than one theme. However, since you can only preach one, and I advise you to preach one, because if you preach more than one, you're going to confuse your audience and you're going to confuse yourself. So preach one theme. You must select the dominating theme that serves your immediate sermonic purpose. When we talk about integrating thoughts, every theme is made up of thoughts that are extracted from the literary unit with exegetical accuracy and spiritual sensitivity. These thoughts become the structure of the expository sermon. Here you must distinguish between exposition and imposition. Remember, the sermon must say what God says and not what you say. As you begin to create the explanation within the exposition, paraphrasing, my brothers and my sisters, is an interesting and applicable way to better understand what the text was saying to the reader at the time it was written. And what you can do with your paraphrasing is create links between what was originally stated to our current time and state it in such a way 
that your audience stays engaged. Use this opportunity to draw your listeners in by trying to make it personal to those who are in your audience. Also remember, before you prepare this portion of your message, you must spend quality time reading, recording, reflecting, and praying over the biblical text. You cannot get away from those items. That's why this is not a rush job. Let's talk about the body of your sermon. Application must be an integral part of the sermon from beginning to end. Unwillingness to obey truth cancels the impact of preaching. The preacher must be, must be careful to present truth in such a way that its relation to character and conduct is both indisputable and irresistible. This portion is what the sermon is all about. It contains your thesis, and we can go over thesis at a later date when we have more time. But this portion contains your thesis and the development of your thesis. Your thesis or sermon sentence lets your audience know what your sermon is all about. And it is the application you have been moving towards. This is what they are here for. You follow up your thesis with your points. And most of the time I use the Trinitarian style, which gives three points. Your points are the fuel that the people have gathered to receive from the gospel message. Like I stated, I do three points. I recommend three points, but you may have something different. But I recommend three points because too little will leave people half full and too much will cause you to lose your audience. You can present your points in two ways. You can list them, one, two, three. You can give a point and an overview of each point. But each point must be biblical. Each point must be logical. Each point must be practical. And each point must be critical. Your points are determined by the word of God. And your audience and the length of time you feel you can hold their attention. Understand your audience. Know your people. When you are unsure, choose prayerfully. And if you are a new minister, I suggest listing your points one, two, three, and I also suggest that you stay in the Gospels. Why do you say that? Because you can never go wrong preaching Jesus. Also, if you are a minister or an assistant to your pastor, stay away from preaching pastoral messages because you are not the pastor. I will state this again. Do your best to stay in the Gospels because you can never go wrong preaching Jesus. Remember once again, it's about God. It's not about you. We're almost done. Now we're going to discuss the close of your sermon. This should be the high point where you celebrate what God has said. This is a unique opportunity to celebrate God and to celebrate with your audience what God has just spoken through you. Remember, we are celebrating God. We are not celebrating self. Now, when you celebrate, I recommend that you craft your closing. You craft it according to who you are. You don't craft it according to somebody else. You are not T.D. Jakes. You are not Bishop Noel Jones. So you must be your authentic self. And remember that people can tell when you're not being authentic. 
I truly recommend that you take your time and craft this portion of your sermon prior to preaching. However, allow the Holy Spirit to use you as you close your sermon. I recommend you never wing your closing. That, my brothers and sisters, can be disastrous. So in this stage of the sermon, I would, ref I would suggest that you reflect on who you are. I would suggest that you reflect on your audience and also reflect on what God is trying to get you to say as you celebrate what God has spoken. Remember, the celebration is not about you. It's about the God in you. So it is my prayer on tonight that this overview of the art of sermon preparation has blessed you. I would challenge you to re-watch this video and take notes. If you have any concerns, any questions, or any anxieties, feel free to reach out to me. You all have a blessed night. And remember, put God first and preach with power. God bless you.